the, oh, there we go. That's good. Okay, so the, uh, let me say uh, before I get started that probably if you were to find a HIPAA training online or attend a training, you would be confronted with a professional who has a fair amount of knowledge, you know, assuming it's in the mental health profession of uh, mental health, um, behavioral health, but also who's probably some kind of cybersecurity expert. So let me just say up front, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, <laughs> but I've done what I can to learn, you know, what would one need to do? Um, and fortunately, there's a lot of consultants available who can help with the more technical aspect of HIPAA compliance that has to do with, um, you know, the security of information stored on electronic devices. I would consider myself pretty expert in um, confidentiality and privacy of client information, having taught a graduate level ethics course for several years and given several presentations to mental health professionals over the years, especially centered around issues of confidentiality and privacy. I feel pretty well versed in that area. And I will say, as we go through understanding HIPAA, so much of it um, really is focused on uh, protecting patients' privacy and confidentiality. And fortunately, mental health professionals have been doing that really well for decades because of our ethics and um, you know our ethical standards around privacy and confidentiality and all of the, I would say, um, security measures that we already have in place and strategies to ensure client privacy. We do a very good job of that. So early on, even when HIPAA was fairly new, mental health professionals would feel like, you know, as they were learning about the HIPAA, um, you know, rules and regulations, they were already doing a very good job. But of course, we've increased the complexity when we start looking at the electronic transmission of protected health information. So that's a big part of focus on for mental health professionals who, like me, tend not to be cybersecurity experts, is really learning what exactly do we need to do to protect client information. And usually we're confronted with learning things we didn't even realize was a security risk. Um, so that may be true for you as I go through this information as well. I did think it would be helpful to uh, start with just some common terms that you uh, come across in learning about uh, HIPAA. First of all, the acronym itself tends to be um, written down as HIPPA, which I think is sort of like uh, we get our lines crossed with hippopotamus, but it is not two P's, it is two A's. And if you wanna look like you know what you're talking about, you wanna make sure it's H-I-P-A. And what H-I-P-A-A stands for is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So just to give you a little bit of background on this, um, back in the mid 90s, and if you remember where you were in the mid 90s, I was like playing around with this new thing called the World Wide Web uh, and was a college student at the time. So it's good to sort of place yourself in that, in that time frame. What was happening in the medical uh, field was that um, insurance claims were incredibly cumbersome and costly in terms of filing claims because different insurance companies had very different um, forms and practices. There was nothing, um, there was no clearinghouse like we have today where there was sort of this standardized way in which insurance was submitted. So there was recognition that um, because the internet was fairly new that we could really streamline the process and be much more efficient and resourceful um, and save a great deal of money if they standardize the insurance claims filing process um, uh, and really recognize that. The other thing they were trying to do with this legislation, and this is where the word portability comes in, is um, set up something so that people between jobs would not lose health insurance benefits. Um, so that if you had ended a job or you were transitioning to another job, what we see now, even today, actually in 2021, is that that hasn't been addressed on a government level where someone does essentially lose their health benefits. And um, we certainly see the effects of that right now with so many people being laid off due to the pandemic. But the original intention was that they were addressing both the need to um, streamline and have a much more efficient process for submitting insurance claims and addressing the issue of having insurance between jobs. So um, 
that's what we were looking at in 1996. And the reason I put 2003 on there, it wasn't until 2003 that the Department of Health and Human Services actually had laws that were then, um, you know, in, in effect, essentially, that not only had they determined they were going to do this, but they had created this other problem where if we're going to be using electronic transmission of protected health information, then we need to have policies in place to ensure that hospitals and medical prof professionals, any healthcare professionals, are, have these guidelines and standards so that they're protecting um, the health information. Of, of their patients. And like I said, um, mental health professionals, I think we're doing that really well already because, because of the ethics codes, because of the legal standards in our profession and because of our commitment, which I consider the cornerstone of, of the work that we do is based around confidentiality. But it wasn't necessarily true for the medical professions. You know, There wasn't the same level of ethical or legal guidance for medical professionals to maintain the privacy of health information. So it's a really good thing to have these regulations and is really important. Um, but I'll be talking about uh, privacy and security. And I, I sort of link privacy more to confidentiality as we understand it as psychologists, as mental health professionals. Um, and security is more having to do with what are the policies and procedures that are set in place to ensure you know, privacy of protected health information. And that's where I think sometimes a more expert level knowledge of, well, how, do, how are you making sure, uh, and we'll talk about all of the different risks associated with mental health practice, but how are you making sure that the client information is protected when you are engaged in not only electronic transmission of uh, insurance claims, but any kind of electronic transmission or communication with or about a client. And I will say that, you know, even though it's sort of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, I would argue that insurance has now become information, right? Health Information uh, Act. Because when we talk about HIPAA, we're actually rarely talking about insurance claims. I mean, it's sort of understood that behind the scenes, we have these systems that protect patient information, um, but we're talking about any and all client information that's transmitted uh, in this sort of digital format. So when you hear the acronym PHI, that stands for Protected Health Information, and that would be any information that would identify a patient or a client, um, whether it be you know, something like their birth date and insurance ID number, or a little more involved in terms of diagnosis or services that they're receiving, or even more detailed information. Of course, as, as psychologists, we understand confidentiality and we have many, many systems in place to ensure we protect client confidentiality, even to the degree that if, you know, we don't confirm or deny if uh, clients are, um, you know, being seen in our practice, for example, and that's something we even train our administrative assistant to be very well versed in, in having ways to, to talk to people that don't uh, in any way um, compromise the privacy of, of clients' information. Um, and when we talk about security and we're saying, well, what are the policies and procedures we have in place to protect clients' privacy? A lot of things were sort of known to us that are really not about digital transmission. But for example, we know that if we have paper files for clients, then we are uh, essentially required to have those paper files behind two locked you know, doors, if you will. So if you have a file cabinet, it's locked, and that is in a room that's locked, which is why you notice our administrative office always has a locked door because we do have files in there. We still have some, some older paper files, even though we've gone paperless. Um, interestingly, there's a sort of interesting technical question of like, who is a covered entity? So the term covered entity is used to describe anyone who needs to comply with HIPAA regulations. Um, and there's a technical answer and a much more broader answer to that. But the technical answer is you are a covered entity if you engage in the transmission, uh, essentially electronically transmit insurance claims. So this is where it gets tied back to, to electronic transmission of insurance claims and not just information as a whole. So my understanding is that a covered entity 
would be any individual private practice, group practice, or any other place where they are submitting insurance claims for clients. And essentially, you are paneled with an insurance and you submit those claims. Of course, that's the case for us. Um, and we do electronically submit our insurance claims through our uh, electronic health record. Um, so we are very clearly bound by HIPAA regulations in our practice. But you might ask, well, what about someone who's in private practice who's essentially 100% cash pay and they're not submitting claims in or out of network for their clients? Well, the technical answer would be, well, they're not in this legislation. They're not bound by the HIPAA rules and regulations um, just by definition of way it's set up in the law. They would not be considered a covered entity. So does that mean they shouldn't um, adhere to HIPAA standards? I, I would suggest no. I mean, I, as a mental health professional, then we know we have a legal and ethical commitment to maintain privacy and confidentiality. HIPAA has established a set of standards and guidelines for doing that. So I think best practice would suggest that you would still um, aspire to meet those standards and have uh, a pretty like clear system for how you're managing risk associated with the potential breach of client uh, information. I also have another acronym that you probably hear sometimes, which is BAA. When you are a business, whether you're a private practice or a group practice or any other agency setting, you're likely going to have business associates. A business associate is any other company or organization with whom you might share protected health information. Um, so, and that would apply not only to individuals or businesses, let's say if you outsource your billing and you work with a billing company, then they would be a business associate. And essentially in order to be covered under HIPAA, it requires that you have documented an agreement with that business associate that they are responsible and have uh, practices to ensure that they protect the health information of the patients and clients with whom you work. So it is, it is required that you have a signed BAA with any business associate. And if you don't, then you are technically in breach of the HIPAA laws. Um, another example of a, a situation where you need a business associate agreement is any sort of outsourced uh, way in which you communicate. So look at your you look at your email, look at how you're storing documents, look at the teletherapy platforms you use. Um, and we'll go over all the examples in our office, even digital phone services, because that's digital transmission of client information, you need to have a signed BAA in order for that to be HIPAA compliant, um, e-fax. Interestingly, like pre-COVID, when we had a landline, well, it just didn't fall under the purview of HIPAA. A landline and a paper fax, you didn't have to have a signed BAA. Once you go digital, it changes uh, the nature of, of the laws associated with that. A HIPAA breach basically would be a situation in which protected health information has been compromised. Usually you see that much more in these larger organizations, think hospital. Um, if there's a HIPAA breach, it, it could impact more than 500 people and there's a regulation around if 500 or more people are impacted by a potential breach of, of information, then there are certain um, laws that go into effect in terms of having to inform those individuals, having to provide sort of credit counseling if, if uh, credit information might be compromised. Probably many of you at one point have gotten a letter about from an insurance company, from a medical office that there might have been a data breach and you may or may not have been affected and they may offer those services. Um, so it's, it's regulated in terms of how you respond to that. Mental health practices, the kinds of HIPAA breaches that are, are, are most common would be a situation where uh, maybe you have a group practice or a small private practice and your computers have been stolen. Um, again, unless you could prove that a breach did not occur, um, then you would have to uh, potentially, what you would do is actually consult with a, an attorney who specializes in, in health professions who's local who could sort of guide you and what is a what is the appropriate response to that 
other things I hear that happen sometimes, actually most commonly, so I'm uber careful about this, is practices who are trying to communicate information to a large number of clients at once and then inadvertently CC a number of clients on that email. So now you've exposed just the, the names of people who are being seen in your practice. So again, uh, that's something you, you would wanna consult a lawyer and know how do I, how do I mitigate the risk associated with that. What, what I aspire to is that we never have a HIPAA breach because we are minimizing the risk of that. But of course, you know, you see that our own government security files can be infiltrated. If somebody's motivated, then, you know, they can hack your system. More than likely, you're going to see that happening in an email and not in an EHR. Usually the bad guys, so to speak, are kind of hacking email or kind of inserting viruses on your computer. Um, and not trying to sort of guess your password for your electronic health record. But I am gonna talk to you about our own kind of methods for how we manage risk in our practice. There are really three uh, areas of HIPAA compliance that are outlined in the regulations that are sort of important for uh, any medical um, profession, but particularly in our case, right, we're looking at our office um, and what do we need to do to reduce the risk of a HIPAA breach. The first is a security risk analysis, uh, and I'll talk about each of these things in a little more detail, but just as an overview. Second is security risk mitigation, and actually oftentimes like those go hand in hand, even as I'm doing the security risk analysis uh, for our practice, I'm simultaneously thinking about how are we mitigating or managing that risk. What have we done or what do we need to do to, to protect the security of the, the private information? And then the final thing, which I think is, is largely neglected in our profession is the written policies and procedures. So somewhere you do wanna have documented um, your risk analysis and, and your mitigation plans and how you've acted on that. Um, and then some sort of annual process you go through to kind of check up on all those systems. And there's some ongoing maintenance, which is generally minimal. It's the upfront work of having this plan. And I think what I've designed in this, this talk is gonna be relevant to most offices, whether you're private practice or group practice. Group practice, the complexity has increased uh, you know, much more, um, but essentially this would give people a very, very good start to managing risk in their, in their own business. Um, the HIPAA regulations are not as specific as you might think. And that's because every office or institution or hospital is distinct and different. So their risk analysis and mitigation plan is, really has to be unique to their site. So the guidance you get from HIPAA is much more like a risk analysis should be thorough and accurate. <laughs> um, but there's no guidance. So you've got to, in a sense, use your own judgment. And I think wisely consult with experts who can provide information about what would be considered thorough and accurate, for example, in a, in a behavioral health outpatient group practice. Um, and then even there, you're gonna see sort of different practices. Like you look at our practice, for example, we have the BYOD policy, the bring your own device, um, which is fairly common in group practices, but then you're dealing with different sort of computer systems and things and providing guidance for people, for example, on encrypting their machines would be something important uh, to, to address. So when I look at um, all the various ways, if we're thinking about risk analysis, I've come up with a list of things that we could say, these are places we transmit or store protected uh, health information for our clients. And they're the areas we wanna focus on to ensure that we have uh, security and safety of this information. So we would look at all of the computers that we use, uh, and the devices. So oftentimes, you know, that would involve smartphones, iPads, and laptops, and desktops. We would look at electronic health records. Now, of course, um, I don't know what percentage of mental health professionals in Maine use an electronic health record, but I would have to guess based on my conversations, it's, it's shockingly less than 50%. 
But increasingly, you see people recognize the importance of electronic health records, not only to kind of be more efficient and organized, but also to ensure that you are protecting um, the client health information. So we'll talk about how we address that with our EHR. Um, electronic form submission, you know, especially more and more people are looking at, you know, paperless offices. And if you provide forms for clients, intake forms, um, brief emotional behavioral screen forms, um, release of information forms, credit card authorization forms, you know, uh, insurance information forms, and the list goes on. I mean, we're basically getting all the protected health information electronically now. Um, and how is that form being submitted and stored? And that's a consideration that's very much relevant to HIPAA. How you file insurance claims, um, emailing, uh, even emailing confirmation with clients, uh, chats, if we're chatting within our group or have consultations within our group, how is that HIPAA compliant? Texting, um, again, document storage, phone fax, and finally, therapy platforms. You'll see some hyperlinks in this presentation, um, which would just give you more information if you're interested, for example, in what are all the HIPAA compliant teletherapy platforms. I'm not gonna to talk too much about teletherapy platforms, but I will say we all know that because we have a emergency, um, I forget the acronym for that right now, but anyway, we're kind of under this like this health emergency. And so the government um, recognized the need to streamline and make available telehealth in a way that had never been done before. And while we had all become familiar to some degree with the telehealth format, you can imagine you know, the thousands of healthcare providers who had never used telehealth. So in order to accommodate that, they basically loosened the rest HIPAA restrictions for teletherapy platforms, effectively allowing uh, doctors, therapists, and what have you to utilize systems that were not technically HIPAA compliant. In other words, you can use systems without a BAA. Um, and so I'll talk about what we use in our group and like some ways in which we are taking advantage of that loosened restriction right now. By the way, that just got um, renewed until April 7th, 2021, and we'll see what happens in April to see if they extend that. Um, so the second step is risk mitigation or risk management. Uh, so these are the things that are recommended um, by, by the HIPAA experts. Um, and again, this might feel a little bit intimidating, but I can assure you if you haven't done some of these things, I just wanna go back to that kind of comforting statement that, that HIPAA compliance is a process but it's really critical. You start that process with the risk analysis and then you work toward mitigation um, and doing the things you need to do. And that takes months. It takes months sometimes to sort of get all that lined up. Um, but we're moving in that direction, certainly at PSM and I think doing a really solid job. One of the things with um, the computers, right? Because if I were to say there was probably one essential thing uh, well, my answer is going to be a little different, but a cybersecurity expert is going to say the most essential thing you can do right away is encrypt your computer. Well, I put a hyperlink there because believe it or not, it's a pretty easy process, um, especially if you have a Mac, but other systems too. Um, and you can go in and figure out how do you encrypt your computer and phone. For a group practice, we would want to have probably documentation where there's some online form, like a Google form, that you essentially sign once you've completed that process, verifying that you've done that. And then you're going to sort of have an annual process where you go back to make sure the computer is safe. My policy has always been sort of formally and informally don't have any protected health information on your device. There's really no need to because we use a EHR. That's where we store all of our documentation per session. That's where all the client demographic information is stored. That's where the, all the client forms are stored. Um, and of course we have a BAA with our, we use therapy notes as you know. Um, the only situation I see where you would likely have some kind of protected health information is frequently we get asked for letters from clients um, and effectively you have to download that letter in some capacity on your computer. 
I suppose we could think of like, if you put it in your Google and you make a Google doc, uh, you probably still have to download it in order to sort of transmit it or upload it into the EHR. So ideally we don't have any protected health information on our computer. If you have something, then you delete it right away and you make sure you delete your, your basket, but good idea to encrypt your computer. I would say for us, the more essential thing would be to use two-factor authentication. And that means if you're logging into your Gmail account, which as you know, G Suite is now, Google recently changed the G Suite to Google Workspace. And that I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm gonna talk about PSM policies in a minute, but we know our Google Workspace account for PSM is HIPAA compliant. And we have a signed BAA from Google for our Google business kind of workspace, which basically means that our uh, transmission of information via email to anyone in our uh, Google workspace account is HIPAA compliant. We have the signed BAA. If you're emailing outside of our account, then it's not HIPAA compliant, which is why we have the Virtru uh, encryption. Um, because we have a signed BAA from Virtru um, that then makes it HIPAA compliant if we are communicating with a client via email. But also because we know in our field the most common HIPAA breach would be somebody hacking into your email or you lose your phone, um, you should all have passwords or passcodes or you need your fingerprint or something to open your phone. Um, but you know, I. Frankly, I have, I have kids who access my phone, even though I try to change my password, they're looking over my shoulder and they feed out my password. So um, even that, right? We wanna make sure we're protecting. So I know that if they're on my phone, there's no way they can actually get access to my email. Not that they'd be interested in that, but um, so we have the password and two-factor authentication. And starting February 1st, that's something you'll see you need to do um, for your G Suite account. And if in, in general, you want to keep your work account, your PSM account separate from your personal account and not sort of sync those two um, emails together. Um, but two-factor authentication is also available on therapy notes and highly recommended so that you wouldn't have to worry, let's say, if you're getting work on your computer or your computer does get stolen because we know like bad things happen sometimes um, and you want to have the confidence that, okay, well, you know, even if someone were to guess my password or have the skills to get into my computer, I'm confident that they can't get into, you know, um, the EHR or my email or what have you. It's also a good idea to install firewall protection on your computer to limit you know, viruses that could infiltrate your device, um, also relatively easy to do. I'll be providing like much more step-by-step -step guidance on this for everyone in our practice. Um, and then keeping your device up to date. I can tell you like 10 years ago in private practice, I would just get so busy. I don't know, I just couldn't be bothered to update my machine until it was like too late to update it. And then I realized like that was really <laughs> not good. So just being mindful of, um, all of those things that, that ultimately are done in the interest of, of our patients to protect their information, just like we would absolutely want uh, for ourselves. So getting in a little bit more to sort of what we're doing at PSM uh, to mitigate risk and um, what we're sort of working toward, if you will. So as far as computers and devices, again, right now the recommendation is, if at all possible, don't have any health, protected health information on your device. Um, but regardless, just a really good idea to encrypt your computer, have two-factor authentication on your G Suite and your Therapy Notes accounts, and make sure you have passwords on all of your devices. Um, Cloud storage is interesting because, you know, again, if you're not putting protected health information on your hard drive, you can sort of bypass this issue because so many things are now going into the cloud. And I can tell you the cloud is like not HIPAA compliant. Like it's done to make our lives easier in some ways, but it certainly isn't recognizing kind of health professions in our, our standards. So it's just important to be, be aware of that. What's really helpful is with our, I'm getting ahead of myself again, with, but with our Google Workspace account, because we know that we have document storage that's HIPAA compliant, again, signed BAA for Google Workspace. So if for some reason 
which I still can't think of a reason why you need protected health information. Well, this would be an example of like our referral list, right? We use a Google Sheet, it's stored in a Google Drive and it's not shared with anyone, but our office administrator uses that to track our referrals and to know people's names, sometimes their insurance information and a little blurb about presenting problem which helps match them. So that's all stored and we've been mindful that we have a signed BAA and that's securely stored. So that would be an example of a time where you would use the Google Drive to store protected health information. Um, but know that that's available and that's a preferred mode of storage as opposed to a hard drive, which is not HIPAA compliant. But, if, but, but anyone out there in private practice that isn't using an EHR is probably, unless you're writing pencil to paper, which still happens, and that's HIPAA compliant, actually, because you're not transmitting anything or storing it, but you need that in lock cabinet, of course. But if you, if you are using your hard drive and have some system for keeping client records like that, then you would absolutely want to make sure your computer is encrypted. So again, no perfect method, but this is how we're trying to mitigate risk. And it depends on how you're, how you're practicing and, and how you document. Our electronic health record, like every electronic health record, offers a signed BAA. We use that for scheduling, documentation. It's where we store intake forms. It's where we store letters, release of information. It's all the insurance information. It's how we do billing. We submit that electronically through therapy notes. And it's also how we store credit card information, which is also HIPAA compliant. So it's an integrated system into therapy notes. So, I mean, I'm a huge fan of EHRs. Um, and I think that although it can be a little intimidating for people to sign on to an EHR and put all their client files in there, it's so worth it. And uh, the cost is minimal. I think for an individual practitioner, it's something like $60 a month. So you save, trust me, you save money, especially if you're using it for claim filing. Um, we don't utilize the patient portal a lot. There is a patient portal in therapy notes. I think it's one of the weaker links in the therapy notes EHR platform, but they're working on it. But I have given you information that if you wanted to share documents with your clients, um, you can have them set up a a set of a login and then you can leave uh, documents for them in the therapy portal. The other option of course is, is encrypting an email with Virtru and sending anything you need to send your client that way. Um, interestingly, there is this like HIPAA loophole where if you, I mean, get, we have Virtru, it's encrypted, we have a BAA, that would be the preferred mode. But technically if a client somehow agrees that they let's say want to um, they want you to send them something in an email that would be protected health information and they give you their permission to do so then they can it's sort of like a client saying look I'm it's it's my information to protect and I'm I'm authorizing you to to send this via email so technically we can I don't know how they would know that like right if you don't have it documented and we can have like a written agreement every time we send an email to a client. But again, Virtru, I think, works really well and, and is a good thing. I want to, I, I don't know if this is on my next slide. So let me say this here, which has to do with electronic paperwork. So we use Intake Q. Intake Q is another system set up that provided us with a BAA and all of our forms whether you know our intake forms, our credit card authorization forms, our uh, emotional behavioral assessment forms, all are intake queue. When clients receive a link to complete a form, they're actually linking directly to intake queue. Um, and they're completing that form and they're submitting it. They're, it. Their form does not get submitted to email. It gets submitted to intake queue Intake Q sends us an email that the form has been completed. And then Valerie, our admin assistant, will go into Intake Q. And that's where she can then download that form right into Therapy Notes. So that's how we maintain HIPAA compliance with our online forms. So uh, you want to make sure that you have a signed BAA if you're using those kind of online forms and electronic submission. We're going to see more and more and more of that. Uh, 
because it's necessary now, especially with remote uh, therapy. Um, insurance claims. We used to actually hire and outsource our billing to a company that was local. They provided us with a BAA. A lot of private practices do that because, you know, they don't manage their own claims. Um, so you just want to make sure you have a BAA with a company that you're working with if they are submitting because they have access to protected health information, right? They have all your client names. They have your clients, uh, um, CPT codes, their diagnosis codes, and um, you want to make sure you protect that uh, and that you're confident that that information is protected. Um, we found that was really redundant because all of the information is already in the EHR. And one of the great things about an EHR is a click of a button and an insurance claim gets directly filed through the clearinghouse and um, it, we are, it's communicated back to us in the EHR. So. It streamlines the process and it's a lot more secure. Uh, email, chat, and text, this all falls under Google Workspace. We're not a big text. I don't think anybody in our practice is, is open or that interested in texting with clients for boundary related issues. Um, but there are a number of formats where you can do that uh, in a HIPAA compliant way. Um, and maybe, I don't know, technology will necessitate some of that, but I think we function really well with our HIPAA compliant email with, with the Virtru encryption. I will just say there, there Virtru and Hushmail are probably the more common um, uh, encrypting, uh, I don't know what the word is like, right? Integrate into your Gmail. So as you all know, we just click a little button in the upper right hand corner of our email. And that means this email is going to go out encrypted, um, which means it's HIPAA compliant. We have a signed BAA with Virtru. Uh, it's not cheap, um, but theoretically anybody can download Virtru. They're essentially getting the same thing, but if you don't have the signed BAA, it's actually not HIPAA compliant. So um, that's a really important point. Uh, and it, it is costly because that's how these companies are making money. Um, Google Chats, you know, we have a, we share, uh, we don't share any protected health information in our Google Chat, but sometimes just consulting. Again, we have a signed BAA um, there, which is good to know. And uh, yeah, so I'm a huge fan of Google Workspace. Uh, there's just so much we can do with it. And of course, they also have Google Call. I haven't found that to be as good as the service that we're using right now, but you could do your, you know, your actual virtual calls through Google as well. Um, and of course, Google Meet, which some of us use for, for our teletherapy platform uh, as a backup or as for meetings is also HIPAA compliant. Um, I think I've talked about document storage again, just that's what we try to go to, Google Workspace. Um, and I love the Google site, which is also HIPAA compliant. Really, that's just how we're organizing all of our shared documents now in this kind of user-friendly um, website-like format. But that can only be accessed by all of us within the group. Um, I don't think we have any protected client information in there, but it's always just comforting to know that, you know, that's HIPAA compliant. Um, we transitioned to digital phone uh, after the pandemic and leaving the office. We use Telzio. There's dozens of um, HIPAA compliant phone, digital phone services available. Lots of people might use like phone.com. That's the only one that's coming to mind, but I know there are several. And there are some like problems with, with a number of them in terms of customer service and reliability. I've really liked what we're using. Um, and we have a signed BAA for both the fax and the phone and the voicemail. So that's been great. And also just important for people to realize you do need that signed BAA um, and using your regular cell phone would be not HIPAA compliant um, technically. So important to know. Teletherapy platforms, obviously like a great area of interest and importance now. Um, there has been some suggestion, like we go back to this idea of covered entity, that if you're engaging in teletherapy, then somehow that makes you a covered entity. 
my my understanding though is if you're not transmitting those electronic claims at least the way hipaa law is written then that's that technical issue of being a covered entity again we are um, bound by ethics and laws that require that we protect client information and we know that if we're using something like facetime that could be compromised. There's that is not HIPAA compliant. There's no signed BAA with FaceTime or Skype or any of the, uh, these other more social non-medical Zoom would be an example where we saw a lot of problems with that breaches like happening on Zoom early in the pandemic. They've upped security. So this is what we're using DoxyMe. What I've read is that's actually the most common um, and popular teletherapy platform. As you know, it's free and it's very easy. You'll want to make sure everybody should have signed the BAA in their own DoxyMe account, but that's why it's uh, HIPAA compliant. Google Meet is a sort of the backup. Uh, this morning I had a nine o'clock on Google Meet. I had a 10 o'clock on DoxyMe and I had an 11 o'clock on Zoom. That's a, so I usually use DoxyMe, but given the circumstances for various people, that's how it went. So I'm, I'm grateful I have these various formats. And the Zoom account I used was an upgraded business account, but it's not one that's uh, HIPAA, technically HIPAA compliant. Well, the Zoom account we use for our groups is the upgraded medical version that has a signed BAA. Um, well, how do I get away with that? Well, because we, we're in a pandemic and there's this emergency health uh, standard that allows us to use platforms that aren't HIPAA compliant. I will strongly recommend that when possible and probably getting in the practice, because as we approach April, we may be in a situation where it's really no longer acceptable to be using these other platforms that aren't HIPAA compliant. Um, I recently had Kate actually look at the sessions, which is a, it's a teletherapy platform that was rolled out by Psychology Today. Many of us, not all of us, but many of us do have profiles on Psychology Today. Um, Kate found that really user-friendly, good quality, um, and similar thing where there's a signed BAA. So it could be another, could be another backup um, if you're familiar with it. Uh, and obviously none of us want to sort of fumble through a backup in the moment, but I think it's always good to start with DoxyMe and have a, a backup. Um, I had a session last week where I don't know why, but I'd had a DoxyMe session, went really well. The next one, the person couldn't hear me. So I quickly sent them a Zoom link and we were up and running. So it's really wise to be prepared with a plan B. Um, Recorded sessions, because we're a training site, we train postdoctoral residents, it's important we have a way to re have our residents record sessions. I myself record some of my own sessions as a couples therapist. Um, and uh, I, the best way to do that right now is recording right in a Google Meet um, because we have assigned BAA. We can store those recorded sessions in the Google Drive, which has a signed BAA. And then in supervision, when we're meeting, we can do a shared screen and watch that session together. So we stay within HIPAA compliance um, by using Google Workspace. And then my recommendation is, you know, if, if that session has been viewed, my recommendation is you delete that and don't continue to store it if it's not necessary. Um, so all of this is like risk mitigation or risk management. This is looking very closely at our practice and all the systems we utilize um, and how we are moving toward meeting HIPAA, HIPAA standards. The big work, if you will, um, is the written policies and procedures. Oh, this is another slide I got off a blog that I thought could be helpful for people who have different um, systems and how to protect their device. So you could click on any of these links. Um, and, and if you have an Android or if you have a Mac or what have you, I think these are smart device uh, instructions. A couple other things as we're wrapping up. Um, and thank you. I know I just threw a lot at you, but I'm hoping it was organized. And I'm hoping actually you're like, oh, wow, OK, I'm learning something. This makes sense. It's not so scary. Maybe I need to encrypt my computer, but we'll get there. Um, 
So yes, ongoing process. And it really does take months. The upfront work of making sure you're HIPAA compliant and actually you know, having everything written down. So in the event, the very, I will say, unlikely event that you have a HIPAA breach, which would be what would potentially trigger a HIPAA audit, um, they would want to see, let me see your risk analysis and policies and procedures um, and, and outcome of your risk analysis. Well, I mean, you better have one. <laughs> um, but my goal is to not have a HIPAA breach so that I never have to do that. But it's always just, I, you know, we try to meet the standards of excellence and, and this is part of it. Um, I will put a, a, just a shout out to outside HIPAA consultants and I have consulted uh, outside HIPAA consultants. Again, these are the cybersecurity experts who are well-versed in mental health. Um, my consultant is called Person-Centered Tech. Uh, Roy Higgins, who's an LCPC practicing, but also has a podcast called, um, that's a good question. What is his podcast called? Uh, Person-Centered Tech, I guess. If, uh, if I'm not right about that, I can let you know. Something to do with mental health and tech. Um, really informative, helpful, not something I would necessarily say you need to listen to because I do that dirty work for you. <laughs> um, but if you're out there on your own in private practice, then I highly recommend you, you listen to it and stay tuned in to what's important to know about. Um, there's other consultants out there too. They do lots of like One Credit CEU, Person Centered Tech does, um, and they, they do much more um, thorough risk analysis and risk mitigation with group practices uh, as well. So you, you could definitely uh, to consult. Security officers, this is just uh, every, our group technically has to have a security officer that is not the owner. Like we've basically allocated Valerie in that role for now, but we may move toward having someone who um, is just sort of keeping charge of our policies and procedures and those annual risk um, mitigation practices, making sure they're collecting all the documents from everyone that their computer's encrypted and they're using two-factor authentication, that kind of thing. It is required that um, a lot of people don't know this or have it, but you do need to have a written notice of privacy practices. If you click that link, you're going to go to our website and see our notice of privacy practices um, right on our website, which is a good place to have it if you have a private practice. Um, some people share that with clients as part of their consent form paperwork, um, but that's, that is a HIPAA, HIPAA requirement. And then finally, I think I mentioned this, the HIPAA breach response. If it's less than 500 people, my advice is to really just consult with a lawyer on how to manage that because every situation is unique in terms of how you have to uh, report that. But usually the advice would be to notify any client who was impacted, notify, depending on your state, your board, um, and can probably you know consult with a lawyer. Um, so again, avoidance is the best policy, I think. So um, we are right at the hour, so I won't keep you any longer, but I am free. So I'm going to stay on for anybody who does have questions um, for me or, or wants to connect. Otherwise, if you have to go, let me see if I can stop share so we can all see each other. Ah, thank you.